Do please sit down. Just a couple of things before I preach. I, I, I apologise to Kate for this slight, uh, my, my loss of attention during the prayers of preparation. As you know, I'm very easily distracted. Uh, and you may have noticed two very beautiful ducks are nesting in the churchyard at the moment. And they, 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 well, I think they may still be there. They're sitting outside the west door at the moment. I'm willing them to come in and join our worship. So, so the creativity of the beautiful nature of the world can be celebrated here. Uh, secondly, if you were confused because you arrived after 9.30 about what happened to the response to the psalm, ask your neighbour and they will explain. And thirdly, I'm obviously not adding. Um, Addy, for, for, for personal reasons and at short notice, has not been able to be with us this morning, which actually, given that her last sermon was, I think, one of the three best sermons I've ever heard in 50 years of listening to sermons, I'm really sorry she's not with us, and it's not a league in which I'm able to compete. Indeed, my offering is uh, just very eccentric, but it's what we've got. My speak in the name of the living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. <coughs> In a book that actually Addie gave to me last year and to which I have referred from this pulpit before, the author Ben Judah, uh, the book being This is London, explores the life of our capital city in harrowing and challenging detail. It charts the extraordinary reality of contemporary London and, of course, its environs, which includes large parts of the Diocese of Chelmsford. Many of his themes revolve around how, in a whole variety of ways, people are enslaved. Enslaved by poverty, exploitation, and indeed by what has become known rather bizarrely as modern slavery. Though, as it looks much like what slavery has always been, the word modern seems unnecessary. But for instance, in Ilford, an area of the Diocese of Chelmsford, through which many of us pass regularly for work, for leisure, as we go to and from the capital, slavery today, as he demonstrates in the most harrowing way, is a significant part of the local economy. And in one chapter, he paints an extraordinary, heroic picture of a Jewish woman in northeast London, who has dedicated her life to rescuing Filipinos, Filipino women in slavery in the local community. That's less than 35 miles from where we're sitting, not in some far off place. Much nearer to home, the nail bars and car washes of Chelmsford, of course, are just as much part of modern slavery in the UK today. Uh, the official estimates of the numbers uh, from the government of, of people actually slaves in our country is between 10,000 and 13,000 people, which is kind of, on one level, very small, but shockingly high in the fifth richest country in the world. Uh, and another shocking statistic that, that, that kind of really is quite painful is that modern slaves are a lot cheaper than traditional slaves. In 1809, the equivalent in today's money of the cost of a slave was 40,000 US dollars. Now the cost of a slave in the developed world is a mere 90 dollars. Slavery, now illegal everywhere, is of course therefore hidden from view, harder to see, and very hard to challenge. I do normally, as you know, start with the scriptures of the day. And all this talk of modern slavery, even as a stand-in preacher at late notice, may sound wide of the mark on a Sunday when we've just been hearing about the love of God, about the Christ who calls us friends. But there is an important issue of translation here. Uh, so breakfast of the Bible get this frequently, but which really annoys me. I mean, I don't mean the breakfast of the Bible get this frequently. Uh, I mean, I mean, just that we need to engage with these texts in real subtlety and recognise that we read them 
and translate them through very special lenses. It's an issue in today's Gospel passage, which is found translated in the same way in almost every modern English translation. And it was rather splendidly actually questioned on Radio 4 in Melvin Bragg's programme In Our Time a few weeks ago. Very grand, you know, very, very grand, highly intellectual discussion. And somebody said, I have no idea why modern translations of, into English of the Bible, of the New Testament, translate this passage wrongly. It was just such a relief to somebody like me. I thought, thank goodness some people take this seriously. The, the version we heard this morning and which is printed in the service book, is taken from the New Revised Standard Version, the most accurate version, uh, widely attested, uh, and the one used solely for academic study across the English-speaking world. And the translation is typical of them all. It's verse 15. I know you haven't got the verse numbers there. It's quite a short passage. Don't worry about looking at it. Jesus said, No longer do I call you servants, because a servant does not know what his master is doing. No longer do I call you servants? Because a servant does not know what his master is doing. That sounds beautiful, doesn't it? We're no longer servants. We no, don't longer, any longer have to wait at table. But he's raised us to a proper dignity as his friends. Well, that innocent little word servant is a terrible mistranslation. There is a perfectly respectable word for servant in Greek, which is used again and again in the New Testament. And it's the word from which we get the, the title deacon. Somebody who serves, therefore, servant. You know, it's that easy. So, so what is it that this word is not the word we find in the text of the New Testament? No. Jesus uses a much darker word here. A dark word in his own time, indeed extremely dark, and in ours also. He uses the word slave. Melvin Bragg's companions on the Grand Radio 4 programme pointed out that there was a period when Christianity, in early Christianity, might have got round to challenging slavery in their context. But how interesting it was that even today, our modern translations sanitise out the word slave, even on the lips of Jesus. What Jesus actually says in the text of the New Testament in verse 15 is, no longer do I call you slaves... Because a slave does not know what his master is doing. These are very, very different words. A slave in Jesus' day, as in ours, is not simply deprived of freedom, but of any kind of agency or choice. It's not simply not being a citizen. It's actually not even having ownership of your own body. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? They're not simply indebted but indentured, subject utterly to the will of their owner, without agency again. And of course, as we said, one historical difference is that because ancient slavery was legal, it was at least regulated. Because modern slavery is illegal everywhere, slaves hidden from sight can be used and abused, and indeed are, with impunity. We have evidence and no doubt. Two things. First, the specific challenges of modern slavery in our own society should and must stir the consequences for all people of goodwill, especially Christians, to act for change. The radical witness and action of so many Christians in the late 18th and early 19th century brought an end to slavery then in our society at significant economic cost. We are called to do the same, both through direct action and through understanding how the way we use our money contributes to the slave economy in our own place and in our own time. Freedom Sunday this year is the 23rd of September. That's the day on which church, churches and communities are invited to reflect, pray, and act in response to modern slavery in order to end it. And the Church of England has already launched the Clure Initiative in which 
Kenneth Edward Carter is involved in order to help the church respond in significant and practical ways, not just by thinking about it. The reality of slavery is, after all, with us day by day. And secondly, and this is kind of the sort of tail end of a spiritualized sermon, if I'm not careful. But this is in, not in any attempt to, to spiritualize all that challenge away. Jesus isn't addressing in chapter 15 of John's Gospel the issue of human slavery, ancient or modern, as he talks with his disciples over supper on the night before he dies. He's talking in a cosmic sense about what it means to be free, about what it means to be truly free. The reason we must translate this passage better, slave, not servant, is that Jesus really does mean slaves. That all human beings are enslaved. Some to our deep, deep shame, literally, as we've seen at some length. The rest of us, metaphorically, if you like, but as I say again and again, just because it's a metaphor doesn't mean it isn't true. For we are just as much enslaved to our compulsions, our money, our possessions, our, our spiritual poverty, and in the mass temptations of our culture, often enslaved to our worst instincts. But in a completely unconditional way, Jesus loves us in our slavery. Indeed, in Philippians 2, verse 7, again, where many translations mistranslate. Paul tells us that Jesus emptied himself, taking the form of a slave. Again, the word is used there. Paul, I'm afraid the NIV says servant at that point. Oh dear. Now the point is, Jesus took the form of a slave. He, he welds himself, not just to our humanity in its skillful glory, no, into our degraded, enslaved, indentured humanity. Rousseau, that radical philosopher and no great friend to institutional Christianity, of course, began his book, The Social Contract, famously with the words, man is born free and everywhere he is in chains. One man thinks himself the master of others, but remains more of a slave than they are. That's our territory, isn't it? That's the domain of the gospel, how we spring the trap of the self in Rowan Williams' great phrase. Yes, we are enslaved. Some in our culture in the clutches of awful, actual reality of real-time slavery, waking up this morning not far from where we pray to another day without agency, without freedom. As bad and as evil today as it was in the time of Jesus. And yet the rest of us, enslaved by the tragic venality of our choices and by our lack of love. But now in this morning's gospel, Jesus makes us the staggering gift of freeing us from bondage, explaining, if you like, the whole purpose of his death and resurrection by calling us to be his friends. Again, a cosmic vision of what we might be. By his death and resurrection, Christ has set us free. That's salvation. That's what salvation sounds like. That's what salvation looks like. The risen Jesus holding out his wounded hands and telling us that we are not enslaved, but that we are free. That we are his friends, the opposite of slaves. And that changes everything. Called from darkness to light, from obsession with our own trivialities, to a passionate concern for others and for their freedom and flourishing, inviting them to, as Christ has invited us, to be friends of God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.